I think it is time for us to begin. It is uh, 11 or four in uh, on the east coast i guess four or four on, in uh, in the uk so today we will uh, we, we are fortunate to have a jpp plasma frontiers colloquium by chris hamilton of the institute of advanced study uh, before we begin i would like uh, to mention next week's colloquium next week's jpp colloquium on uh, March 2nd will be given by Emily Belli of General Atomics, will be chaired by Bill Dorland, and it will be on multi-scale nature of turbulence in the tokamak pedestal. All right, but coming back to today's talk. Uh, so Chris Hamilton is now a postdoctoral fellow in astrophysics at the Institute for Advanced Study. And before that, he got his undergraduate degree in Oxford at uh, at uh, uh, Merton College uh, in 2017. After that, he was a PhD student with Roman Rafikov at, um, uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and he received um, the International Astronomical Union's 2021 PhD prize for his PhD work. And since 21, he is uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, Chris is an expert on uh, kinetic physics of most, as I understand, you know, stellar systems, dynamical systems, things like good galaxies, uh, globular clusters, uh, planetary systems, and so forth. And uh, he is also interested in kinetic theory in general of stellar systems and plasmas. So today we uh, let us welcome Chris. Uh, the title of today's talk is, as you can see, on the kinetics of spinning stellar systems or the galactic tokamak. So it's a very interesting title. We will see. I'm intrigued to learn what it means. <laughs> okay, all right. So please go ahead and get started, Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, we, we shall, uh, I shall mute everybody uh, first and, uh, and then Chris, you will unmute yourself. Okay. Just give me a moment to do this. Mute all. All right, and Chris, now you can unmute yourself and uh, begin the talk. Okay, am I audible? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for the invitation uh, the, and for the introduction. The thesis that I want to develop for the next 45 or 50 minutes is that we galactic dynamicists, in fact, are plasma physicists. We don't, just don't know it yet. I'm not going to talk about specifically the thing on this slide, but let me just give you a vignette of what I mean by this. 50 years ago, almost exactly, this is a paper published in 1973, Robert Dewar from uh, PPPL was looking at the saturation of kinetic instabilities in homogeneous plasmas. You put a Langmuir wave or an ion acoustic wave through a plasma and it grows by inverse Landau damping. It has some growth rate gamma, and he realized that when the particles get trapped, when the, when the wave becomes sufficiently nonlinear that the particles get trapped inside the wave, the wave will ultimately saturate. And he got this uh, saturation condition, which is the thing in the black box there, which is the bounce frequency of the electrons. The wave amplitude saturates when the bounce frequency of the electrons is 256 over 9 pi squared, multiplied by this Landau growth rate. So, my contention is that galactic dynamics has an awful lot to learn from plasma physics. And in fact, we're roughly half a century behind. So as an example of this, last week, I posted this to the archive. This is on saturation of spiral instabilities in disk galaxies. So if you look at the picture on the left, that's a galaxy called M51. That's a grand, grand design galaxy. And you see these beautiful spiral arms there. You can think of them in many cases as linear instabilities of the underlying background distribution function. And you can calculate, assuming that stars get trapped inside the spiral waves, which they do, you can calculate what is the saturation amplitude. And so there's a bounce frequency or a libration frequency around the resonance. And the, it turns out that the, the spiral saturates when this bounce frequency is 256 over 9 pi squared, square root of m times gamma, where gamma, again, is the Landau growth rate of the spiral. m, in this case, is the number of spiral arms. So in the picture that I'm showing you there, M would be equal to two. But for a one-armed spiral, the problem of saturation of uh, 
angular momentum transfer and saturation of spiral instabilities is actually isomorphic to the problem of saturation of instabilities in a homogeneous plasma. So that's just one example where I think we're something like half a century behind and we have some catching up to do. If that is what your appetite somewhat, then John O'Squire asked me to advertise this, which is a KITP program in June and July 2024, precisely uh, probing this interconnection between the physics of plasmas and that of self-gravitating systems. You'll recognize some of the names in the uh, organizing list there. So make sure to sign up to that if this, decide by the end of the talk, if this is interesting enough for you to sign up for that uh, program. Okay, this is the other thing that I'm not going to discuss. So the obvious parallel between plasmas and galaxies is that galaxies are just in effect gravitostatic plasmas. That is to say that the force between two charges, Q1, Q2 over R squared, is directly analogous to the force between two masses, M1, M2 over R squared. And you can spin up an awful lot of kinetic theory based on this analog. And I've done that in various papers. You can take a look at them there. I also taught a lecture course on precisely this, um, on this, on this topic in kinetics of stellar systems at Oxford uh, last year. And I have 50 pages of lecture notes on my website, should you be interested in checking those out. So let me finally get to the talk proper. The stuff I want to talk about today is on the kinetics of what I call spinning stellar systems, or more provocatively, the galactic tokamak. For those of you who are astrophysicists in the audience, let me uh, throw you a bit of red meat and change that to an even more pretentious title of how plasma theory can rescue dark matter. You'll see what I mean by this soon enough. The work that I'm going to talk about was done alongside these three people. I'm sure you recognize a few of them. Uh, so Libby Tolman and Lev Azamaski were both of the Institute for Advanced Study. Libby has since moved to the CCA in New York. And fourth was Vinicius Duarte, who's at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Now, apart from me, none of these people had done any galactic dynamics before. In fact, Vinicius had never written an astrophysics paper before. Um, but I didn't let them get away with that. So the paper we ah, so this was my attempt to be a plasma physicist, of course, they are real plasma physicists, and for today only, I get to be a fake plasma physicist. But we wrote this paper together called Galactic Bar Resonances with Diffusion, which I hope will appear in uh, the Astrophysical Journal soon. It's been very favorably reviewed. Um, and the point of this paper is to look at the interaction of stars in a bar at the center of a galaxy with a dark matter halo. I'm going to define what all of these things mean in due course. But it turns out that this problem is very closely analogous to what is being done for wave particle interactions in tokamaks. And so we're able to collect all of the knowledge of these uh, people together and come up with something which I think is quite interesting and important for galactic dynamics and cosmology. So that's what I want to do today. So I'm going to split the talk into three parts. I'm first going to assume that you know absolutely nothing about astrophysics. I know some of you know more than I do about astrophysics, but I'm going to assume that you know nothing. I'm going to tell you about what bars are and what halos are, and then I'm going to give you some plasma analogs for this bar halo interaction problem. And then I'm going to tell you about how you describe the interaction of bars full of stars and the dark matter halos that surround them mathematically, um, especially in the presence of some diffusion. And that's the extra thing that we've added here in this paper. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the implications of this for the astrophysics, for the cosmology, and for our understanding of large scale structure and of dark matter. So let me get started with an introduction to astrophysical background. So what's this dark matter stuff? So our best understanding of how the universe formed and how galaxies formed is that the universe is filled with these tendrils, this web of dark matter. That's the stuff that's sort of schematically shown here with the, um, the dark lines. Of course, dark matter doesn't emit any light, so you can't actually see it, but it interacts gravitationally. And we infer it's there because there are all sorts of dynamical effects, basically, where there ought to be a lot more gravity there than what we can see. So we infer that there's a lot more matter there than we can actually see, and that's what we call dark matter. And these days, the entirety of standard model of cosmology, of galaxy formation, of how we got here in the first place, is all down to this dark matter, so-called lambda CTF, cold dark matter model. If I just zoom in on this little nodule 
um, in the white box. What you're seeing there is not a star, it's not a galaxy, it's a cluster of galaxies. So this whole picture is from a simulation in which you put in dark matter, you also put in a lot of gas and you allow galaxies to form. In particular, galaxies like to form in the bits where the dark matter clumps together because that's where the gravitational potential is the strongest. So all the baryons, the stuff that you and I are made of, fall into there, they form stars, they form galaxies, and that's the bright spot here. If I was able to zoom into this, it might look something like that. So this image cost about $10 billion. This is from James Webb Space Telescope. This is one of their flagship images from the first few days. And so this is the galaxy cluster SMAX 0723. What you see here are dozens and dozens of galaxies gravitationally bound and all in a huge dark matter halo. So the, the, the fact that they're gravitationally bound is predominantly due to the fact that there's this load of dark matter which is surrounding them all and pulling them all together. Now, let me zoom in even further and just look at this little guy in the blue box there. If we zoom into that, that's a galaxy. It's a disk galaxy. It looks just like a smudge. But supposing I had JWST squared, it might look something like this. OK, so now we're getting down to the scales that we're actually going to be talking about in this uh, in this colloquium. So this is M51. This is the Whirlpool galaxy. And we're looking at it pretty much face on. So it's very, very thin. If you were to look at it edge on, we're looking at it from the top down, if you like. And you see it has these beautiful spiral arms. There's a lot of star formation going on. And this galaxy actually has a companion. You see the thing to the top right is a smaller galaxy, which is orbiting the large galaxy. And in this case, it's the small galaxy that's actually producing the spiral structure. This is a beautiful image, but it's actually slightly unusual because this galaxy does not have a bar. Now, you might not know what I mean by that, but you'll know when I show you the next picture. This galaxy has a bar. Okay, this is NGC 4394. You see that there is a very clear, uh, almost rectangular, elongated structure at the center of the galaxy. And that's a collection of stars, really a collection of orbits, collection of stellar orbits. And it turns out that these are very, very predominant in real galaxies, something like 60 or 70 percent, depending on how you count. But most galaxies have bars. And the bars don't just sit there, as you can probably tell by looking at it, this system is actually spinning. Okay, so this bar is spinning. And of course, it's surrounded by a dark matter halo. It's interacting a little bit with the spirals and the other stars that are in the galaxy, but predominantly that bar is interacting dynamically with the huge dark matter halo, spherical kind of dark matter halo, which is surrounding it. That's the interaction that I'm gonna focus on today. So we cartoon this up by saying there's a bar there and it's rotating at some rate. Um, and bars are not all that simple. So the fact that we see these spinning bars is actually a problem. In the last few years, there have been several papers like this one, which speak to the fact that when you look at bars in the sky, when you look at things like this, they are spinning quickly. But the theory says that the bars should be spinning slowly. By theory here, I actually mean simulations. I mean one of those big simulations like the picture I showed you before, where you put in a load of dark matter, a load of gas, you form a load of galaxies, and then you look at the galaxies and you say, they have bars, and how fast are the bars spinning? And the simulations show, I've thrown a lot of stuff under the carpet here for simplicity, but the simulations basically show that the bars slow down rapidly. Whereas the observed bars are not slowing down, they're still spinning quickly. And so this is one of the major things that people say is a problem with our entire understanding of how the universe formed, how it evolved, and how we got where we are. The whole Lambda CDM cold dark matter cosmology model, is it up for grabs? Is it, is it uh, teetering on the brink? Because these bars are not spinning in the way they should be. Now, by the end of this talk, I hope to provide a sort of tentative solution to this problem. So I'm going to strip everything back to the absolute simplest cartoonish po model possible. And I'm just going to talk about this yellow thing in the center. That's my bar. And it's surrounded by a spherical dark matter halo. That's the gray thing. And the bar is going to be rotating. Chris, I think Bill Dorland raised his hand. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Chris, why is there a bar in the first place? Can you briefly address that? 
yeah so it's a good question it's not completely settled but for instance if you just have a disk um most disks are unstable to these bar the bar is kind of a soliton and you can have an axisymmetric disk that doesn't have a bar in it and under many circumstances if the disk is cold enough basically it'll just buckle or go unstable into this bar um configuration it's a similar reason to why you have the spirals uh we can talk about we can talk about what the bar actually is it's a collection of intricate orbits at the center of the galaxy called x1 orbits but it's essentially an instability it's called a buckling thank instability. yeah thank you yeah so this is the picture that i want to talk about for the rest of this colloquium so we have a bar which is rotating and it's going to interact with a dark matter halo which surrounds it I've stripped away all the spirals, I've stripped away all the other stars, and I'm just looking at the bar halo interaction. In particular, I'm going to assume that I have a sort of xy axis, which is in the frame of the bar. And so the z axis is pointing out of the plane, and the bar is rotating in azimuth as if it was pinned at the center. It's rotating in azimuth with constant pattern speed omega p. So omega p is just the frequency at which the bar is rotating. And it turns out that real bars do probably work like this in that they actually are like, they work as if they were rigid bodies to, to you know, first approximation, as if they were rigid bodies and they just rotate. So what happens? Well, let me mock up here. These are density contours. These are a cartoon of some density contours, the black lines of the dark matter halo particles. So this dark matter halo is made of dark matter particles. We don't know what those particles are made of but there are billions and trillions and gazillions of them. And this is the density of those particles. Now, of course, what the bar is gonna do is it's gonna stir up these particles. So I'm assuming here that at time zero, I just have a perfectly spherical, relaxed, quiescent halo, and the bar is gonna stir it up. So this is what happens as a function of time, is that the, and I'm sitting now in the rotating frame of the bar. So the bar is always fixed along the horizontal axis, but of course, we're really in a rotating frame. Basically, what you see just at first glance is that the dark matter halo responds gravitationally to the bar, and it starts to slosh around a little. And in particular, if I look at this part of the simulation, which is from half a giga year, so half a billion years, remember the universe is on the order of 10 billion years, so half a giga year. So a reasonable chunk of the evolution of the galaxy. At this time, the um, contours of this dark matter density are positive on the top left and on the bottom right of this plot. But the bar is trying to rotate anti-clockwise. In other words, there's an overdensity behind the bar, which is going to pull it back because the overdensity has a greater gravitational pull. So moving a bar through a dark matter halo is like trying to stir your spoon through a jar of treacle the trickle will push back on it and try to slow the spoon down via friction. This is nothing other than dynamical friction. In other words, dynamical friction, the classic picture is you take a heavy body and you try to push it through a gravitational field of lighter bodies. Those lighter bodies will cluster, will form a wake behind the heavy body and pull back on it. That's the frictional force. So the, bar, the, the picture of bar halo interaction is actually a story of dynamical friction. Of course, when I have that friction on the bar, that's going to slow the bar down. I'm not actually going to get into the details of how the bar's pattern speed changes with time in this talk. We can talk about that later. But for simplicity, all the calculations I'm going to show are going to assume a fixed pattern speed. And I'm just going to be interested in calculating the frictional torque. Of course, I could take that frictional torque and then evolve the bar forward. So it has a new pattern speed, calculate the new friction and so on. I could do it self-consistently, but for simplicity, I'm not going to do that. I'm just interested in calculating the torque. How are we going to calculate this torque? Well, first of all, we're going to write down the Hamiltonian for the dark matter particles. So each particle has a velocity V in a position X, and it has this Hamiltonian. V squared over two is just its kinetic energy. Phi naught is the spherical potential of the halo, which is the dominant thing. And then delta phi is going to be the perturbation in the potential due to the bar. So in this case, the halo potential, I'm taking something called the Hernquist potential. Don't worry what that means. And the bar potential has this funny form that you see at the bottom. Again, you don't need to know what the specifics of this are. The only important thing of that bar potential on the bottom right is that it has this form cosine of two phi minus omega pt. 
which simply means that it's rotating in azimuth in that curly phi direction at a constant pattern speed omega p. And I've written in the bottom left that the ratio of the strength of these bits of the Hamiltonian, delta phi over phi naught, is on the order of 2%. That is, the maximum acceleration that you feel due to the bar is only ever something like 2% of the acceleration you feel due to the halo. So you might think of this bar as a weak perturbation. Okay, we're gonna describe how the dark matter halo responds to the bar, but the dark matter halo is nothing more than a collection of dark matter orbits. So first to understand, we need to understand what the orbits look like if there was no bar, and then we're gonna put in the bar and see how the orbits change. So this bit of the talk is actually a little bit easier to explain to plasma physicists because you have a concept of orbits than it is to explain to a lot of astrophysicists. So suppose there was no bar and the, and the potential just looked like this. So it's purely motion in a spherical, spherically symmetric central potential. Then what the orbit of an individual dark matter particle looks like is this, it's a rosette, okay? In particular, you can always think of one of these orbits as a, as, a, as a superposition of an azimuthal oscillation as this particle goes around and a radial oscillation as it goes in and out. Now you should start to be thinking of um, motion of electrons in magnetic traps when I, I'm starting to talk about this. So here are three other orbits. Of course, every dark matter particle is on a slightly different orbit, but these three different examples show that um, just because the, so the, the, the individual orbits look different, but overall they're essentially the same thing. It's just that this pericenter, which is what we call the green circle here, the inner distance, and the apocenter, which is the outer distance, is slightly different between the three. But they're all of this rosette form, um, and they all have constant pericenter and constant apocenter, and they all consist of two oscillations, one azimuthally, round and round, and one radially, in and out. And a dark matter halo, is nothing more than a collection of these orbits. Okay, slight bit of technicality here, sorry about this, but again, this is something the talking about people actually know when the astrophysicists often don't. So in order to describe this, of course, it's best not to use positions and velocities. As you know, people on this call all too well, for periodic motions, it's best to use adiabatic invariants in order to label your orbits. So we're gonna to change to a set of coordinates, theta and j, which are angle action coordinates, such that the j's are just the adiabatic invariants of the motion. The, they're the adiabatic invariants that correspond to the radial oscillations in and out and the azimuthal oscillations round and round. So let me just make that a bit more concrete. In this case, those j's are what we call the radial action jr and the angular momentum l. These are very, very similar to your two adiabatic invariants that you have for particles moving in magnetic bottles. Okay, so L is just the angular momentum. That's how rapidly do you go round and round as in Italy. And the radial action is the integral over the radial momentum over an orbit. So it's how rapidly are you going in and out. That's it, two coupled oscillations. In other words, an action, when I tell you the action, you know what orbit you're on. You know what your rosette looks like. Whereas the angle tells you instantaneously where you currently are on that orbit. It tells you the phase. And the frequency tells you the rate at which you go around that orbit. Okay, that's the end of the angle action coordinates. If you don't know anything about angle action coordinates and you didn't follow that, just think of J as velocity and theta as position. That'll be enough for the rest of the talk. If you did follow what I just said, then if I go back to these three orbits, the one on the left has a JR, which is much, much less than the angular momentum L. And that's because the radial motion is not very important, which is why the orbit looks nearly like a circle. Whereas for the one on the right, the radial motion is very important, but the angular mo motion is not. And so the radial action is much bigger than the angular momentum. And the orbit in the middle is where the two are fairly comparable. But basically, I give you those two numbers and you know exactly what the orbit is going to look like. OK, so this is what we had before. And now we're using this new language. We can actually simplify this great. Uh, there is another question uh, yes, go ahead. From, from Bill. Bill is asking, why are the orbits circular instead of elliptical? Ah, so um, 
you get elliptical orbits if you are talking about a point mass at the center of a galaxy. Um, when you have something which is not a point mass, then that ellipse starts to precess. You could actually think, if you look at the orbit on the right here, they are kind of ellipses, but it's an ellipse that's gradually processing, like Mercury's orbit does. Okay, So if, it, if the whole potential of the dark matter halo was just concentrated at the center, you'd have perfect ellipse. But because it's not, it's an ellipse that gradually processes, and so it fills this donut shape. Yeah. Okay, so a galaxy is a collection, a, a dark matter halo, sorry, is a collection of these rosettes. In this new language, I can simplify this picture. I can simply say that the Hamiltonian is equal to the unperturbed Hamiltonian that we've just been discussing, H0, which only depends on the actions. And then there's a bar perturbation, delta phi, which depends on the angles and the actions and on time. So that's the potential of the bar. OK. Now I want to work out how the bar is going to evolve. To do that, I need to work out what's the torque on the bar. To do that, I'm going to invoke my uh, kindergarten Newton's laws. The torque on one halo particle, I use Hamilton's equations, and it tells me that dLz by dt is minus the derivative of the per perturbation with respect to the conjugate angle. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. All I'm doing is working out what's the torque on one halo particle. Now, the total torque on the bar by Newton's laws must be equal to minus the total torque on the halo because the whole angular momentum of the system has to be conserved. And so to calculate the total torque on the bar, I just take the equation above, I multiply by F, which is now the distribution function of the dark matter halo particles. That tells me how many dark matter halo particles do I have at position X and velocity V, or equivalently angle theta and action J. I multiply those two together, and then I integrate over the entire phase space, over the entire halo. And that gives me this thing that I call T, which is the total torque on the bar. And from that, I'm going to be able to work out how the bar evolves. And then once I've got how the bar evolves, I can look at the observations and I can say, does this actually match what we see in reality? But of course, I'm not quite done. I'm not quite done because I don't know what F is. I need to calculate F. Because F is going to tell me how many dark matter particles there are in which part of the phase space. And remember, before we saw that it was the orientation of the dark matter particles that meant that there was going to be friction on the bar. And there was this complicated motion where they were sloshing around next to the bar. So I need to calculate F. But F is just the distribution function of a collisionless system. It's a system moving under purely Hamiltonian dynamics. And so it satisfies the Vlasov equation. So all I need to do, all I need to do, you people know that it's not easy, is to solve the Vlasov equation, plug it into the middle expression, and then I have the torque, and then I'm done. Well, Linden, Bell, and Kalnice did this in 1972. The way they did it was they linearized the Vlasov equation. So they said, let's pretend that the bar perturbation is very weak. Remember, it's like a 2% effect. It's not an unreasonable thing to assume. And then I'm going to work out what's the change to the distribution function because of this little perturbation. And this is the answer. So these ends now, you can think you would call them Ks as wave numbers. They're slightly different in our case. They're sets of integers, but don't worry about it. So the response of the distribution function at wave number n is given by this integral. This is the standard thing from linear theory. It depends on the gradient of the distribution function, and it also depends linearly on the perturbation delta phi. Now, I take that expression, and I simply plug it into the middle equation here, and I perform the integral. The answer is what you have on the bottom. This is called the linden bell kalnice torque. Now, this is a finite number, and it turns out it's nearly always negative. For all basically reasonable distribution functions, this is negative. Well, that's what we expected, because we expected the bar to slow down. This is a frictional torque. Negative torque means you're taking angular momentum out of the bar, so the bar is going to slow down. Notice one other thing about this, which is that it's resonant. See this delta function resonance here that says that uh, in order to have any contribution to the torque at all, I have to have an exact match between n dot omega, which is a combination of the particle frequencies as they're orbiting the dark matter halo, and n phi omega p, which is the bar's pattern speed. So the orbital motion of the dark matter particles has to match the rate at which the bar is rotating. And so that is the resonance condition, and it's only at resonances that anything happens. Yes, Amitabha. Amitabha. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, whether it's producers damping or not would depend on what F0 is. Yeah. As you mentioned yourself, if F0 is monotonic in J, that's fine. Is it clear that what F0 you should use is right. necessarily of that type? So, uh, yes, we can discuss this if you like. Um, if, if F0 is isotropic, that is, if all the distribution, the particles in the distribution are just going random directions, then this is definitely negative. Mm -hmm. You can take an F0 such that the halo is spinning. I'm not considering today spinning halos. If you spin the halo up enough, you can change the sign of this talk. Exactly. Yeah. That's an important point, but I'm not going to go into it today. OK. Uh, OK, so this is a finite thing. It tells you that the bar is going to slow down. And you might have noticed this is severely redolent of Landau damping. This is more or less the Landau damping, the Landau uh, damping rate formula. In the Landau case, you could think of the linear momentum transfer between a wave and a particle, let's say a Langmuir wave and an electron. In this case, we're talking about the angular momentum transfer between a wave, that is our rotating bar, and the dark matter particles. But it's essentially the same thing. You could actually recover one from the other if you'd like. So are we done? Well, no, we're not done. The problem is that this predicts too much friction. Now, this is adapted from Weinberg and Katz. I'm not showing the uh, precise details of what went on here, but basically they calculated the rate at which Lindenbaum Kalnice, this equation in the red box, would tell you that the bar ought to slow down. And the time scale here is a few billion years, so less than the age of the galaxy. And it would essentially say that the bar ought to slow down on a much shorter time scale than we expect. Because remember, we look at the sky and we see that the observed bars are spinning fast. They're not spinning slowly. So there's a problem here. What has gone wrong with the Linden Bell and Kalmice picture? Well, O'Neill and Mazutov knew back in 1965 what goes wrong with the Landau damping picture. And 20 years later, Tremaine and Weinberg came along and they re rediscovered effectively the same thing in stellar systems. The problem is that Linden Bell Kalnais, the thing I just showed you, has this delta function resonance condition. But if you're on a delta function resonance, if you're perfectly on resonance, you can't any longer think of that perturbation as linear. Right, a linear perturbation would say that the particles are going on their rosettes and the bar just very gently nudges them so that they're still going all the way around the galaxy, but they go on a slightly different orbit. But O'Neill and Mazatov and Tremaine and Weinberg understood that if you're very close to resonance, that's not what happens at all. Instead, you get trapped. So, um, oh, how do I want to do this? How do you deal, how did O'Neill deal with a trapped orbit? You move into the frame of the wave. In these variables, that means that we move to something called slow angle and slow action space, which all we're effectively doing is moving into the rotating frame of the wave. And then we look at what is the motion in that rotating frame. And we can get rid of the, if you like, perpendicular motions and only can concentrate on the parallel motions. And then in that case, the whole dynamics reduces to that of a pendulum. So these trapped orbits inside this wave can be described as if they were just a pendulum, which is exactly what I showed you before. When the trapped electrons are stuck at the bottom of one of these plasma waves, they oscillate back and forth as if they were in a pendulum potential, exactly like this. Before I get back to the bar, what does pendulum dynamics look like? So we know that a pendulum has liberating orbits and circulating orbits and a separatrix in between. So on the x-axis here, I'm plotting the angle it could be position, if you like, in a, a, a co-moving frame of a wave in a plasma. And on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the action. Or if you like, in a plasma, this is just the velocity. And the colors here are just tracing particles. I'll tell you what they mean later. Oops. And you see what happens is that these particles get stuck to one of these contours. And overall, you phase mix up. You mix up this distribution inside the separatrix. So the trapped orbits and the untrapped orbits are going on completely different trajectories. Back to the bar. So the thing I've just shown you is in phase space, and that's at the top here. So you go from a distribution which is, doesn't care about the angles 
to one which is trapped inside the separatrix and is sloshing around and is winding up inside the separatrix. Those are the trapped orbits. In the physical space of the bar, I'm starting off with a set of orbits that don't care about the bar, and then I'm ending up with a set of orbits that are trapped at certain resonances. So the thick black circle that you see on the bottom right, that's a resonance location. It's actually called the corrotation resonance. And so remember, we're in the rotating frame of the bar here. And the overdensity that you see is because a lot of particles are getting trapped on one side of the bar or the other. These are effectively Lagrange points. If you know anything about planetary dynamics, you're getting stuck on one side of a perturbation and not processing out of it. So there are some particles which will get trapped on one side of the bar, a bit like only ever seeing with the same face of the moon. You only ever see the same side of the bar as you both co-rotate. Notice that in this picture, the, the distribution function of the dark matter halo particles, remember that's what the contours are, is almost symmetric. So we have an almost symmetric distribution on the left and on the right, and a symmetric distribution means there's no more torque. Remember, the torque was a dynamical friction thing, which relied on there being an asymmetry. You had to have something behind the bar which was lagging it, that was pulling the bar back. But now what we find is that if you account for this nonlinear trapping, and you phase mix it up, you get a symmetric distribution on both sides of the bar, which means that the bar will continue to rotate at the same pattern speed and it won't slow down. So that was Tremaine and Weinberg's result. Now, this is just to show you that this is actually uh, correct. You can, you can um, on the left, I'm showing you that simulation of stars getting trapped inside a bar or of dark matter particles getting trapped inside a bar. In the middle column, I'm showing you the results of linear theory, which is what Lin Landau or Linton Bell and Kalmeis would have used. You see that it doesn't reproduce the simulation at all. But on the right, I'm showing you the results of nonlinear theory using that pendulum equation, and you reproduce exactly what the simulation tells you you should. Okay, so that pendulum equation works. So Tremaine and Weinberg found that if you do the pendulum analysis, you allow everything to phase mix up, you end up with a symmetric density distribution. And a symmetric density distribution means no torque, which of course is completely different to what Lyndon Bell and Kalnice said. So Tremaine and Weinberg are able to rejoice. They're able to say, look, this is the reason why the bars are spinning rapidly. When you account for the nonlinearity, the particles actually get trapped on either side. The torque goes to zero, not like Lyndon Bell and Kalnice would have said. So the bar ceases to slow down. Therefore, there's no problem. Dark matter is saved. Okay, so after half an hour, I get to, get to tell you what we did. I'm going to close this window because there's a gaggle of geese outside. Okay. Sorry, it's an appreciative that. audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all flying away, so they didn't like it at all. Right, so um, that's all background. I was worried about this. The reason I was worried was the following. Both Lyndon Bell Kalnice and Tremaine Weinberg, and if you like Landau and O'Neill, were solving purely collision-less problems. In other words, they were solving for this distribution function f with like the top equation, which is df by dt plus this Poisson bracket of f with h equals zero. h, of course, is the perturbation due to the bar plus the dark matter halo potential. But of course, in reality, you never actually have a collisionless system. And there's always some diffusion some noise, some substructure in the dark matter, some molecular clouds that happen to be flying past, or crucially simulation noise, because you can only resolve your simulation so well, artificial diffusion. And that's all gonna be clumped under the right-hand side in some kind of collision operator. And so I was worried, how does this diffusion, which is always there, you can't get rid of it to some level, how does it affect these delicate resonant phenomena? Does, do they just all break down? The way I solved this was as follows, where we solved this was as follows. We took this equation, we took the simplest example of a collision operator we could think of. So I've gone into dimensionless variables here. And so we have a kinetic uh, equation on the bottom left, which is dft tau plus j dft phi minus sine phi dft j. That's just the left-hand side of the thing on the top. That's just the thing that you would have done in the Landau or the O'Neill calculation. The additional thing is the right-hand side, which is a collision operator, a diffusive collision operator, in the actions. So if you like, it's just diffusion in velocity. And the prefactor, when you go to these dimensionless variables, is what we call delta. Now, this delta is going to be very important for the rest of the talk. 
delta is the strength of diffusion. So delta is this libration time divided by diffusion time. What do I mean by that? So the libration time is what you would call the bounce time. So that's the time once you're stuck inside a resonance, how long does it take you to bounce from one side of the librating orbit to the other? And the diffusion time is the time it takes you for the stochasticity from whatever cause it might be to kick you from one side of the resonance to the other. Those are the two key time scales. So when delta is zero, the diffusion is completely unimportant and we recover the old theory. But when delta is large, the diffusion is the dominant thing and the resonance perhaps we can forget about entirely. Okay. Now the key um, insight of this paper, and this was also noted by Peter Cato and uh, Libby Tolman, the reason that people justify their cosmological simulations is that the relaxation time of those simulations is hugely long, much longer than the age of the universe. They say, look, our system, our velocity of a particle is not changing by order unity in the age of the universe. Therefore, our simulation is resolved. That's not the point. That's not the key collisional time scale. What they need to compare is the time it takes to diffuse across the resonance, which is a much narrower portion of phase space than the entirety of phase space, which is what the relaxation time refers to. So this diffusion time is much shorter than the relaxation time. And so you can have appreciable values of this delta, this, this diffusion strength, even in a system whose relaxation time is way longer than a Hubble time. What sort of numbers do you get? So I plug in the numbers, I do this estimate, and if you take the standard of model of cosmology as we know it, this delta is actually extremely small, completely negligible. So you might say, well, what the hell's the point in all of this that you've been doing, Chris? Like for the last 40 minutes, you told us this diffusion is important. And in fact, it's not. So it's not in the real world if that real world is described by the standard model of dark matter. Let me give you some reasons why it might be important. One is that we don't know what dark matter is made of. And so it also has other problems. One of the solutions that's rendered a lot of interest in recent years is this so-called fuzzy dark matter for which delta is 0.1, sort of a 10% effect. If you apply this theory not to the bar halo interactions, but to the bar star interactions, that is you care about the stuff that's going on in the galactic disk, then delta is of order one, really important. Actually, more important than all of this, if we go back to the standard cosmology, is that it might be negligible in the real world, but in simulations, it's not. So remember this picture that I'm showing you there is a simulation where you're forming tons and tons of galaxies all in one simulation. You're trying to resolve it as well as you can, but you have artificial noise. You calculate what that artificial noise gives you on the right-hand side of this kinetic equation. And of course, all of the things that happen in galaxies in the simulations are supposedly delicate resonant phenomena. And if you have some artificial diffusion, you're perhaps going to destroy those resonant phenomena. So I would say delta in some simulations is 0.1. I would actually guess it's quite a lot higher in some simulations. In some, it's smaller but it's at least worth considering. Before I tell you how we solve this equation and what the results are, I want to uh, justify the subtitle, which is that this equation is actually exactly the same as the one that people are using in Tokamaks to understand particle energization. So of course they don't have dark matter particles, they have ions, and they don't have rotating bars, but they have alpha waves. And so they look at the resonant interactions between ions and alpha waves. And they have diffusion, they have collisions with the background species. And so it was actually coming across uh, Vinicius Duarte's paper from 2019 that inspired me to be able to solve this equation and, and then ultimately get through the whole thing. But this has been solved in various limits, the large delta limit and the small delta limit in plasma physics. So again, we're way behind in galactic dynamics. Chris, uh, Amitava has a question. Yes, Amitava, go ahead. You... Thank you, Chris uh, and Dimitri. So you're keeping only the diffusion term of a potential yep. uh, Fokker Planck description with constant collision frequency and uh, for fluctuation dissipation theorems and things of the type, it's necessary to keep both. Yep. How importantly will the results be modified if right. you actually kept a drag term? Yes. So if this is artificial diffusion, then there is basically no drag and you only need the diffusion term. If it's a physical diffusion, of course, you should have a drag term. Now, the difference with a plasma to a galaxy is that the drag term is always weighted by 
the mass of the thing that's being um, the mass of the thing that's feeling the drag compared to the mass of the thing that's sorry let me put it another way the diffusion term is weighted by the mass of the thing that's doing the diffusion the drag term is weighted by the mass of the thing that's feeling the drag so these dark matter particles are uh, if they're interacting with large scale substructure or huge molecular clouds or something they're being diffused a lot but the friction that they feel is not very large because they're their mass is, on its own is very, very small. Um, in practical purposes, this would be important if you were looking at the interaction with the stellar disk. It would shift the frequencies a little bit. So Vinicius has a paper on this. Um, I don't think it would make too much difference to the rest of the conclusions. And it wouldn't make, it wouldn't change anything with regards to the numerical diffusion. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so I'm going to now just show you the numerical solution to that equation. We actually can solve it analytically in various limits. I'll just show you the numerical solution. So this is what happens to particles near a resonance. There are lots of particles in the red region, and there are not many particles in the blue region. And what happens to them is this. So I'm going to show you for different values of delta. So on the top left, you've already seen this. This is when this delta is very, very small. This is essentially, has it frozen? No, we're still going. This is essentially O'Neill's calculation from 1964. The particle distribution just gets wrapped up inside the resonance. Uh, is the movie still going? Because it's not for me. Very slowly. Okay. Um, uh... Hopefully the next one will work better. Right. So now I'm in the top right, I'm making, oh, it's no good. I'm just going to skip to the, the answer. No, we can just show the uh, final. Okay, this is the final slide, yeah. Okay, so this is what the final distribution function looks like. So for delta very, very small, that's in the top left, you see that the distribution gets smeared out evenly within this separatrix. And in particular, you have the same number of particles on one side of zero, if you like, as you do on the other side. Left to right, there's a symmetry. That symmetry is exactly the symmetry that gives you the no friction result from earlier. But when I add in a little bit of diffusion, you see that I have a little wisp of yellow. This is in the top right panel now. You see, I have a little wisp of yellow on the right hand side and a little wisp of blue on the left hand side. And so there are a few more particles on one side of the bar than there are on the other. And that's going to lead to a finite torque because you no longer have this symmetric distribution. The contours here, of course, are the contours of that pendulum Hamiltonian that I showed you before, along which the particles would like to move if they weren't being diffused. But if you look at the bottom left panel, now delta is of order one. And the, the distribution is not wrapping up around those contours anywhere near as much as it was in the upper panels. And finally, if I take delta equals 10, which is the bottom right panel, so diffusion is 10 times stronger than the resonance, now it barely evolves at all. The distribution function barely evolves at all. Okay, the question is, what does this do to the friction? So I'm almost at the end, and I finally get to tell you the result. So remember, I take this equation in the middle, which is the torque that the bar feels, and now I'm going to ask, how does that depend on diffusion? And so I'm going to compute the F using me, my equation that I've just solved. I take those solutions, I plug them into the middle equation, and then I perform the integral. And I'm going to show you the answer. So this is the frictional torque, the slowdown rate of the bar, as a function of time for various diffusion strengths. So if we start with the dark blue delta, the dark blue line, that's the delta of 10 to the minus three, very, very small amount of diffusion. You see that uh, it oscillates on a time scale of a few billion years or maybe half a billion years. And then it, set, it, it, it reaches a steady state, which is around zero, okay? So it oscillates about zero and eventually it basically settles on zero. That is in the Tremaine and Weinberg limit, in the O'Neill limit, in the small delta limit, the distribution function sloshes around, it symmetrizes, and you end up with no torque after some time. Now, if I add in some diffusion, so look at the cyan line, the light blue line here, with delta of 0.1, which you remember, that's the comparable, that's probably comparable to what's going on in the simulation, something of that order. Well, now you get some friction to begin with, but then it saturates at a level which is not zero. In other words, that is going to mean that the bar continues to slow down. And that's because you produce this asymmetry, this persistent asymmetry in the distribution. And from the other colors, you see that if I make the distribution, uh, if I make the diffusion very strong, 
I get something which is very far from zero. So those colored lines at the top are very far from zero. Note also that I've normalized this by the Linden Bell Kalmites. That's the linear theory rate. So equivalently, uh, as you increase the amount of diffusion, you actually recover the linear theory, more or less. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Okay. So I think this is my final plot. So what I've done here is I've just taken the final value of this torque, and I've run this for many, many different values of delta, and now I'm plotting it as a function of delta. So, Tremaine and Weinberg, or equivalently O'Neill in the plasma context, would be all the way down the left-hand side of this plot. They would say that for delta goes to zero, the distribution function mixes up, everything gets symmetrized, and the ultimate torque is zero. Whereas Lindenbaum and Kalmai, so equivalently Landau, would be at one on this plot. You see that I start from some very, very small value of delta, and as I increase it a little bit, I add in a 10%, a 1% or a 10% diffusion, I suddenly get a torque which is very different from zero, and it grows something like delta to the four fifths. Now, if you just look at the black line for now, I can go into what the different colors mean, but if you just look at the black line, you see that as delta gets bigger than one, it actually saturates at a constant value. That constant value is pretty close to the LBK linear regime. In other words, diffusion relinearizes the resonant dynamics. Now, I thought this was a very cool result. I thought I'd discovered something, but back to my contention from the start, this was of course done 50 years ago in plasma theory. So this was done both by Johnston and by Auerbach in slightly different contexts, looking at what happens to a wave when you allow it to grow via Landau damping or decay by Landau damping when you also have collisions. And they showed that you go from the O'Neill regime into the Landau regime, provided you have enough collisionality. So I hadn't really discovered anything. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that, yes, so I gave you that question at the start of, um, is dark matter in some kind of crisis? Are the bars really spinning too fast for the, for the theory? Well, probably not. And so the real world, you probably are at some very, very small value of delta. So the Tremaine Weinberg limit is correct. And so the bar shouldn't be slowing down anymore. But in these simulations, delta is probably on the order of 0.1. And so you're getting a slowdown rate, which is maybe 30% of the LPK rate, which is enough to slow a bar down significantly over its lifetime. In other words, the artificial numerical diffusion that's going in um, to the simulations is producing too much friction. And that's probably what's slowing the bars down. I won't rubber stamp that. Ask me back to give another colloquium in a year's time and I'll tell you whether that's, a, whether that's really the answer. So observed bars spin fast, simulated bars spin slowly. And I expect that spin simulated bars actually fin, spin artificially slowly because of too much numerical diffusion. I'll leave you with this. This is a slide showing um, the place where this paper fits in the sort of literature. This is a literature review in one table, if you like. So really all I've been talking about for the entire talk are wave particle interactions, whether it be in plasma kinetics or galactic dynamics. You can have linear, nonlinear wave particle interactions with and without collisions. The bottom, the, our paper fits in this fourth quadrant here on the bottom right hand panel. But as you can see, I learned an awful lot from reading plasma papers and uh, and plasma theory has an awful lot to teach us. In other words, galactic dynamicists really are plasma theorists. We just don't know it yet. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>